Welcome to my podcast Cool Down with Abhay where I bring in different people from the sports industry to come and engage in conversation with me so that you and I can learn more about the Indian sports ecosystem. Let's get right into it. Hey guys, hello and welcome to this episode of uh, Cool Down with Abhay and I'm really excited for this episode uh, because my guest today is Alko Shatori. Uh, for those who may not know him, he was most recently the head coach of uh, Kerala Blasters Football Club. And he's actually the youngest uh, coach to obtain a UFA Pro license by KVNB, which is amazing. So let's get right into it and welcome. Hi, Elko. Good afternoon. Hopefully you're fine. I think you're in Bangalore. And to all the people in India, uh, stay safe. And uh, hopefully this nightmare will be over soon. Uh, here I am now. Everything is opening up again. And uh, I hope that we can go back to, to normal. But... Uh, doesn't look like it yet, but we stay positive and uh, we uh, we keep our hopes up. And thank you for inviting me. Definitely. I think the best thing to do right now is just to be optimistic. So uh, how I like to typically start off the podcast is I ask my guests how they got into the sport that they follow. So uh, I think you used to be a player before a coach, right? So could you tell me how you got into football? Uh, yes, I I started uh, off playing football when I was very young, uh, at the age of six, seven. Um, normally in Holland, uh, each small village has a football club, an amateur club. And then uh, from there, I got recruited for a professional club in Holland. It's called the Fortuna Sittard. I went there through the whole youth um, youth system till I was 18. Um, was already a few times training with the first team. Uh, was a very talented player and I say that with, with humbleness, I, I don't want to be arrogant, but I, I was a very skillful player. Uh, and unfortunately, on, on the age of 18, I lost my mother to, uh, to suicide and that had a huge impact on my football career. In the up following two, three years, it was for me very difficult to focus to, to actually be uh, involved in football. I still was playing, but in the year after, I had to leave because I was not uh, 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 getting up to the to the standard. At the same time, uh, I was doing uh, like a sports university. Uh, already was involved in coaching with with, with some youth, uh, and basically uh, in in those upcoming three years after, I still played some football. I still played some semi professional in Belgium, but I never never fulfilled the full potential that I think that I had. Uh, I decided also to to quit. Uh, at that same time, I got an internship that was related to my uh, sports university in VVV Venlo. Uh, and there I started off my, my coaching career. I stayed there for 11 years and that's when I, I went off into the, into the world. So my, my football career, um, I still have pain in my heart that I quit it, but at the same time, it, it was at that time very difficult to really had my mindset on on uh, yeah becoming a professional football player because of, of those circumstances. That's that's really amazing, and I'm happy that you've still channeled all of that, and you've you've continued to follow your passion and stay with football, and move into coaching. And you've got this crazy opportunity where you've gone to many countries and you've coached. You've been to Holland, you've been to the Middle East and Africa. I am a little curious about the Middle East because I've heard a lot about the football culture over there. And I've heard the stories I've heard are pretty crazy. So uh, from your experience, could you tell me a little about it? First of all, um, it, it, it enhanced my, uh, my ability to coach because uh, when you get in contact with different cultures, you become a different coach. And that doesn't mean my philosophy of football changes, but it, it changes your philosophy of how to deal with people, uh, being more patient, just in, in general, the, the, the management around the team becomes different. And I think for any coach uh, who, who goes abroad, uh, it will enhance you if, if you are open to learn. If you just stick to your own principles and many coaches, I know a lot of English coaches or I see it and even Dutch coaches when I see them arriving in other countries for the first time and things are not that organized, they all start shouting and being frustrated. So one of the good things from that experience, either it was in the Middle East, in Africa or India, um, is that you become a better coach. Uh, that is one. Two, the, the opposite side of it is that uh, your face or your uh, qualities, uh, you basically get out of 
touch with, with Europe and my ambition is to, to coach on the highest possible level. So, uh, and to go back to Europe is difficult. I'm trying at the moment to, to get back, uh, but that, that is a, the wrong side of everything. Uh, coaching in the Middle East specifically, um, I see, I saw a lot of development in the last basically already 15 years or I'm, I'm 18 years basically already out of my country. Um, in the beginning, uh, when I arrived for the first time, it was in 2003, I think, uh, in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, there, at that time, you already could see that Arabic clubs were inviting foreign coaches, even on the youth level, having youth, uh, coaches from foreign countries. And you can see they, yeah, they de developed uh, forward. Of course, um, when you get to the Middle East, you have to take care of, uh, yeah, there's a, it's a different religion. It's a different football style. And all these things, yeah, they made me, a, in, as I said, a better coach. Uh, and uh, everywhere I worked, I always was happy to, to uh, embrace uh, those cultures and uh, take my advantage as a coach uh, out of it. That's awesome. That's, that's really fascinating. So uh, being from Netherlands, I imagine that you have a really, you're influenced a lot by Johan Cruyff, right? I, I would imagine. Um, I am someone who in my childhood, I actually didn't really read a lot of books. I started uh, reading later on in my teenagers. And one of the first books I actually picked up was Cruyff's uh, My Turn, my, my Side of My Turn. And I learned, I learned so much about him and his influence on, on the sport. And I would love to hear, um, being from Netherlands, what's your, how much has he actually influenced you? Um, Johan Cruyff, and, and yeah, it doesn't matter. People will argue. Uh, for me, was the is the best player ever. And, and, and not, not because he was... No, I, I say it wrong. He was the, the best coach and best player ever. The combination. He was the most all-round football person that I know. He was and a top coach and he was a top player. He was best player in the world. Um, he, he basically invented the false nine. Uh, all the Barcelona f philosophy is basically coming all from Cruyff. Uh, everyone's about their uh, Spanish coaches. They are amazing. But Spanish football didn't do anything uh, before uh, Guardiola really started uh, implementing the playing style uh, perfecting the playing style of Cruyff. So the, what is it in 2006 or I, I don't exactly, I don't remember when Guardiola started, but before that Spain never did anything on, on the national, on the international uh, and now Spanish coaches are yeah, wanted everywhere, but it's in my opinion, and I don't have anything against Spanish coaches, don't get me wrong. But what I want to say is, and that's what I want to, to uh, emphasize on is that um, Johan Cruyff had a huge influence on, on the football, especially in the 70s, uh, where total football was introduced. And of course, we had a coach, uh, Rinus Michels, but basically all that came from, from Johan Cruyff, who, yeah, uh, the pressing, uh, playing with an offside line, um, the false nine, uh, attacking defenders, basically, is all, all come from, uh, from Johan Cruyff. Uh, in, Nine, in, the, in the 90s, so I'm talking about beginning 90s till the midway 90s, he was coach of Barcelona. That was Dream Team 1. Yeah, that's, that's when I was already starting to coach. And that is something where uh, yeah, I really got infected with, uh, with Cruyff's coaching style. And before that, I already knew him as a player. That's really nice. So uh, let's move on to uh, your journey when you came to India. Uh, your first club over here was with Prayag United. Can you tell me... Uh, before we even talk about the club, what was your impression of India when you first came here and Indian football? Yeah, um, I will. When I arrived, uh, it was a culture shock for me, mm. the good to the bad, both ways. Uh, and I'm always a very honest person. I don't believe too much in diplomacy. I always say diplomacy is a is a polite way of lying. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 and I don't mean that that you d diplomacy for me is not. Just say what you think, and you can say that in a, in a gentle way, in a nice way. So when I say a cultural shock uh, in India was that, yeah, when you see uh, people on the street uh, being so poor, although I already had, had an experience in Africa also, that is painful for me. I'm a very, I, I'm somebody who likes justice. I, I, I think the whole, everyone, doesn't matter where you come from, uh, equality. Uh, so either you black, white, doesn't matter, everyone is equal. So the moment I arrived in, 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 uh, in India, you see poor people. That is was always painful for me. Uh, you see some very beautiful cultural things. Uh, so overall, 
uh, it was a cultural shock. But as I said, I take it as a positive. Uh, the playing style, the football in India um, uh, was uh, yeah, completely different than I was used to. And what is the most important thing to take out is that um, you could see that there was talent. Uh, there were a few players I still remember from that time are really good players, actually, uh, who still is playing now, for instance, uh, Siki Venit. At that time, he was um, beginning 20s, I think, or 19, 20, I don't remember exactly. But he was starting uh, uh, with my team. He's do doing really well. Uh, but you could also see that the creativity, the creativity of players was less than what I see now. And the creativity, I think, is a little bit um, related to, to, to India is that, uh, yeah, you know, the caste system. So basically you, you always listen to the elder one and the way I come from, it's the opposite. Uh, even when you're young and you have something to say, you say it. So creativity is more stimulated. And I also, also saw that in the football. I remember Mohammed Rafiq, uh, he, uh, he was at that time 17 or 18 and he had, uh, tremendous uh, uh, technical qualities and I put him behind the striker at that time and he really really developed but you could also see that before that he was never really used uh, on his quality that creativity was never stimulated it was all about the English of uh, in India mostly the game was playing long ball the English way and, and run and physicality so and that made a huge uh, development uh, already, I think, uh, in the last, uh, yeah, what is it, 10 years. Uh, so that, that's a positive. And um, if you want to know how I got to India, I was basically on, um, at that time, uh, Wim Kuvermans, he was the head coach of the national team. Uh, and I got an agent who asked me if I was interested to come to India. First, I didn't want to come. Uh, I had a talk, uh, a call with uh, Wim Kuvermans and I asked him, said, well, how is the situation there? And he basically told me, uh, yeah, it, it's going to be, a, it's a sleeping giant. Uh, things are developing. So I decided to come to have a foot in the door, maybe for the future. So that's basically the story how I ended up in India. That's really fascinating. So and you're, you're really uh, fortunate with the fact that your first few clubs were with, with uh, Prague United and with East Bengal, which were in Kolkata. So you got to actually experience the hub of Indian football the, in your first instance, which is pretty cool. So um, what was your experience from those like Kolkata derbies and watching Calcutta Football League? All of the, what's your um, thoughts about Kolkata Football? Um, first of all, um... And, and many people, many people, they, they don't see this or they all think uh, when uh, you compare uh, CVs of coaches who are arriving now in India and you look at their CVs, they don't have really a background or don't have a bigger background. And I mean it with, with respect. But when, but when you start at a club, uh, when you get the chance to start at a club from the beginning and you can do the, the recruitment, then you have a good chance of success. When I came to East Bengal, when I came to even Prayag United, I came halfway the season. Uh, and there were even yeah, other circumstances with, with East Bengal, where, where the, at that time the, the, the president was, uh, was in jail. Uh, very difficult circumstances. But the people don't care. They think they will look at, at the results you, uh, you had. Actually, with the Prayag United, we did really well. To be honest, still, even if I came halfway this season, we won the AFI Shield and in the end, we ended third or fourth in the league. Uh, and with East Bengal, I only stayed for three months. I came in February. Uh, that was the first year when the ISL was played. Uh, and all those players who came back from a very uh, dense program of the ISL, when they came back, a lot of them got injured while, while we started playing with, uh, with East Bengal. And so... Um, yeah, it was was uh, was difficult. Uh, but if you talk about football culture, uh, that was beautiful. Uh, in East Bengal, has beautiful supporters, has a huge fan base. Uh, you could you could feel they had a club, they had their own club. So these things are are very nice, and you could clearly see that the Kolkata is a uh, yeah a football domain in India, and that that is always yeah, if you go work somewhere, you want to to breathe and you want to feel football. That's for sure. That that was a big positive. Yeah, definitely. And I agree with you. Like, uh, I wouldn't judge the East Bengal phase because it was such a short amount of time to actually judge. And it was towards the ending of the season, if I'm correct, right? So Yes, it was. And as, as I said, the thing is, 
that was the first season of ISL, and the ISL was played then in, in three months. They played every two, three days, played games. And from East Bengal that time, we had a lot of players who played in the AS, ISL. And when they come back, and if you play in three months, so many games, you're over. And a lot of them, they got, uh, yeah, they got also injuries while we were, uh, were doing the, the league. We still did a decent job, in my opinion. You could see had a little bit of a rocky start because I had to uh, start at the AFC Cup. Uh, and yeah, then you, you need to win. But uh, overall, the playing style improved. Uh, you could see slowly, slowly things growing. But I well, was not time enough for to, to... And as I said, I didn't choose any players of the team. I was not involved in the recruitment whatsoever. Uh, yeah, and that, that is always difficult if you get judged on something that basically you come to help. And then in the end, uh, you were not able to, um, as I said, do the recruitment or get a little bit of longer time. And yeah, it's, it's, it's fine that people don't really understand that. And coaches who come in, who don't have really a background, and, but get a chance to build something from the beginning uh, and get some result. And yeah, they will say oh, that, that he's at least a good coach or a better coach. But that's unfortunately part of football and still part of Indian football culture, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So uh, after that, you got the opportunity, opportunity to work at the home of uh, most of India's youth talent. Uh, with Northeast United, right? And for most people who are who are passionate about working with youth development, this is the perfect club for them. So, can you uh, share with me about your experience with the youngsters and how you were able to actually uh, give so many players debuts over there, right? Uh, one of the good things uh, when I started at Northeast is uh, that at least we got a result, and a, I think a very special result. If we were a little bit more lucky, if we had a little bit of a, a deeper uh, a team that means a little bit more overall quality we could have reached the, the the final even in my opinion but overall we did really well but the northeast region is very special to me uh, first of all i think men if you look at indian players um, uh, playing in the isl i think the majority will be from the from the northeast region and uh, even while I remember in my first year with, um, or even with East Bengal actually, so uh, Prayak and East Bengal, when you travel to the Northeast region, like to Shillong, uh, which uh, is around, I forget. Yes, and uh, Sikkim even also, sorry. I actually did a research uh, recently where I found out that 15% of uh, the total ISL Indian players comes from Mizoram. Yeah, and and. One of the things I noticed when we travel there, you see even women working beside the road. I mean, they have really an, an, an uh, how do you call it? They're strong. They're strong people. You can see that mentally and physically. Uh, but beside that, and that is football is is most important. Of course, you need you need to have skill. And I think um, yeah, it's it's a special special area in India where a lot of talents come from. Uh, and uh, yeah, that was it was a good experience um, this year. Unfortunately. Because I can continue at uh, at Kerala, we 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 uh, just before I left, or even a little bit before, we were busy to already trying to recruit for the season after. Uh, Putia, uh, I, I don't know the full name, who played at Northeast, is going now to uh, to Kerala. Uh, that's one of the players, the youngest player, he's 18 years old or something or 19. I don't forget, but he did really well, and he would he is coming now to Kerala. So I was happy to start working with him again, but unfortunately that uh, that didn't happen. So overall, Northeast, a, f a fantastic area where uh, a lot of talent come from. And that also shows in the numbers, as you said, uh, within the ISL. So you brought up uh, Kerala Blasters. So if we were to look back on your Kerala Blasters career, let's not talk about the ending for now, but what would what, what you say was your greatest accomplishment or learning from working with them? Um, no, let's, let's look at what we achieved. Uh, the first, first question from the supporters was they wanted a different playing style. They, I don't know how many messages I got in the beginning of the season said, Coach, we don't care if we become champion or not. We want a different playing style, an attacking playing style. That playing style was achieved. Then uh, we scored the highest amount of goals in, in the history of, uh, of Kerala Blasters in the six seasons. So that means that playing style is showing that the the that we had an attacking playing style because we scored the most amount of goals in their history. Um, they never beat uh, Bangaluru before. Uh, look at, for instance, uh, Goa in the last three seasons. Not, not once beat uh, Bangaluru. Uh, 
and with with Kala, as I said, Kala never beat Bangaluru. We beat them uh, this season. Um, we had the highest top scorer in in the season of uh, of Kerala. Um, we uh, we had some good. We made still some good young. Uh, how do you call it? Young uh, players who who made their debut, like uh, KP and uh, Jackson. Uh, so overall, if you look at um, if you look at, at, at what we achieved, uh, there was progress. Progress was been made 100% and under very difficult circumstances, simply because, yeah, I, I, I was just re reading a, uh, an article about uh, Odisha, that uh, the coach, he finally revealed why he left uh, Odisha, this gombo. He basically said that living in Odisha was more difficult uh, because his kids were not there and they had to go to school in Delhi, etc. Uh, and he also said, yeah, our turning point in the season was when we had two injuries. That was the striker and one of the midfielders. And basically, the, 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 the article is saying, yeah, that is true. So you were doing well, but when you had the injuries, it was, uh, it was a turning point. But for, for Kerala Blasters or for Coach Ilko, it was excuses all season. The only thing I heard is Ilko is seeking excuses. Well, 17 games in a row, I played with a different setup and still made progress and still we had, um, as I said, I just uh, gave you a, a few uh, achievements we had and you would build on that for the next season. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, yeah, that was, was not the case. Uh, my personal, uh, like my favorite part of you as a coach is the fact that you, you put in a lot of effort into actually developing these Indian players, right? And you make, you, you actually put in the effort to make sure that you're not like you're not using the foreigners unless you actually have to use them basically right i um actually i i want to add something else even what i was saying before uh look at um uh, jessel the left back he came from goa this player who was for the last i don't know how many seasons playing in the goa league so that is even that is even below the uh, in uh, the i league and he was the, he made a huge development this player and now I see some clubs suddenly picking up also players from Goa League. So there's all, all, all things where I say, uh, and I give praise to, to, to Ishvak, my assistant, because he chose this player uh, and he played with him before. But in the beginning, uh, when we started, yeah, you will have said that this player, he's from, from, from Goa League, how he's going to compete. But I put a lot of work in these things with young players. With, it doesn't matter it, it, to improve them. Everyone was... Very critical, very critical on, on Messi, Messi Bully. Uh, this, this player didn't score any goals in any other leagues. He was the second top scorer. He, I don't know, he scored, I think, eight, eight goals and a few assists. And that criticism afterwards, uh, yeah, as I, even on, on TV, many times was said, yeah, we're not sure if this, uh, if this player is going to bring Keller what they need, etc. But, and one of my strengths is, and, and I do believe in that, is... Um, if you improve the individual, you will also improve the team. Uh, and either they're young or old, it doesn't matter. If Bartok Beci was not doing well and I had another player who would do better and in Nina, I would put him. I don't care. That is, that is, as I said, I don't believe in diplomacy. I don't believe in, in uh, just being straightforward because that's the only way. That's what top sport actually is. I, I do believe even that's what life is, uh, just being honest and... and uh, uh, get the maximum out of uh, out of people if you work with, with uh, in this case with football players. So if if you actually look back at the uh, season from an outsider's perspective, I think the biggest challenge that you would have faced was with injuries and probably with referees also. But that that is something which all clubs are actually suffering from. But um, what do you think went wrong with with uh, the last season? Yeah, it's it's very simple, um, and. I found it always unbelievable that if you go to a doctor and the doctor tells you that you have uh, uh, a certain problem within your body, you listen to the, to the doctor and you will tell him the program to follow, the medicines to take. Without thinking, most people do this. So I am 25 years in, in coaching uh, and in all clubs where I worked, I never had so many injuries. Never. And, not, and I'm very actually cautious on these things. Um, there are two, two main reasons why um, there were, we had injuries. That is one, 
if you plan a season, if you start a season, you make a pre-season planning. And that means six to eight weeks, you make a pre-season planning. The plan was to go to Dubai. Uh, we went to Dubai. Everything was planned. The games, uh, we had a training facility, everything was planned. After one week, we were in Dubai, we had to come back. Uh, there were problems with the hotel, so we had to come back to India. So the moment we came back to India, you have to make a whole new planning. And physical preparation in football means you plan the games, and then within, in between, you plan the physical trainings. And that you have to do uh, up front. You cannot do that from, from week to week. So when we came back to India, we didn't know who we were going to play. Uh, and the teams we played, they were not really from a high level because they already had plans on their own. So mm. we had to, to, yeah, to fix, to try to, to hustle, to get teams uh, to play against us. That's one big part where we didn't have a good preparation physically. Still, still I, I was able to work around that a little bit. The second thing uh, is uh, we had uh, uh, Gyro, the center back, left center back. He arrived with an injury. Mario Arques, he arrived on the first day with an injury. Uh, Sandesh, he arrived, he came back from the, from the national team and within a week or uh, he, he trained one week with us a little bit. He had problem on his shoulder, on his knee and, in, and his hip. And then he went back to national team and also got an injury. So already my center, center back uh, duo was already injured. Now, because of the bad preparation, and especially in the defense, I had already some, some, uh, some injuries. Uh, the medical staff, uh, who ha is responsible for implementing a program uh, of, of when you are injured and coming back to, to the field, that was not good enough. Uh, that's how simple it was. And um, it's called a back-to-play protocol. So if you uh, get injured and from the injury, Till the time you get back to the field, there needs to be a good protocol. And that was just simply not good enough. And uh, we, I tried to work with it. I tried to, uh, that was something, for instance, for the new season to improve. But uh, yeah, then it's easy to blame the coach and uh, say that the results are not good. But uh, I think I did the best possibly I could. And I would have do even better in the next season. I'm 100% convinced of that. That's nice. So I think the best part of uh, Kerala Blasters is the fan base that they have, the Manja Pada. So uh, I would like, uh, you have a good relationship with the fans. Even after you have left the club, there are lots of people who are sending messages and tweeting about how they wa never wanted you to leave, that uh, they want you back already. So can you tell me what uh, Manja Pada means to you? Um, I had the same with Northeast, actually. Uh, I'm the type of person, as I said, it's not, about, it's not about being a nice person. It's not about pretending to be somebody or uh, I am all about honesty. Uh, and there's one thing that I believe in in life is uh, communication. A good communication decides the quality of your life. Between you and me, if we have a good communication, uh, we can even grow a good relationship, but it makes each other understand. It's the same thing to the fans. If you don't communicate to your fans, uh, and they have a lot of uh, expectations uh, or you, you, you don't speak out on what things about what happening then people will get, they, they will, they will not be happy. And then when you get bad results, things become worse. So after a season like this, where we became seventh, uh, still a big part of the, uh, the fans had, yeah, somehow uh, I had a good relationship with and why I think because of my, passion that I really, really with all of my heart want to succeed to what I'm doing, but also that I once in a while communicate with them. And many people always keep saying you should not talk to the fans and it's not good on Twitter or whatever, but I never go into discussions. I just give people some information to try to make them understand and that you don't have to agree on things, but at least it's the effort, the effort to, to build a connection and, uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the things I think I succeeded in both clubs. But some people sometimes see that different. Uh, but that is what it is.
Yeah. So, okay. So I would like, I would like to uh, gather a few learnings from your insights and experiences as a, as a football coach. Okay. So when you're, when a team or a coach is deciding a philosophy, is it something that you have in your head whenever, regardless of the club, or is it something that you have to adapt to once you move to a club? How, how do you create a philosophy, playing philosophy? No, uh, philosophy is, is, I have very, very clear. I have a, a framework, um, uh, key points that, that, that doesn't matter where you go to. Um, I will give you a small example. Um, so basically the, the, the big of the starting point of my philosophy are, are my values. I have five, five core values. And so uh, if I work with people together, I will try to find people who have similar values or at least three because people with the same values they work the best together and what my top value is winning winning wanting to win i want at all cost i want to win so if i recruit somebody either as my assistant coach or the goalkeeper or what anyway i want to see in this person that he has an attitude to win you can see in both teams last year with northeast uh, even this year in kerala uh, all the games that i coached even when we lost we never lost more than one game and we had a lot of comebacks even so uh, and that comes from uh, uh, implementing a, a winning mentality. So to, to give you an example, the second thing within my philosophy is a, um, are four pillars. There are four pillars that I, if I work with people together, one is communication, one is organization and it needs to be a structure in the way you work. Uh, the third thing is discipline. That means that we just don't do things for the sake of uh, doing them, but there need to be a discipline because most days, if you say, like, let's say you do, do 100 days of work, maybe 20 days are very good, but 80 days you're not really in the mood in any job you do. And then you need to have certain discipline to still do your things. And the fourth thing is uh, emotional involvement. I want to work with people who don't do things because they have to. I, do, I want to work with people who, who, who are, have joy in the things they do. Then you go to uh, the third part of my um, uh, philosophy is uh, development uh, and the development means development of the individual development of the team and development of the club and they have all spread out uh, other uh, things that I, I take care of and the last thing is the general football vision how do i see football so those four things and they are spread out in in in, in many different subjects uh, that i use in order to uh, to build a team uh, the thing that you always have to look at or what is very important is the culture where you start working the, the club culture the country culture uh, the facilities that a club has they do have an influence but the starting point the philosophy is, is is always the same for me you know i've told you this before i'm a big fan of your video analysis that you like like you put out regularly and i like you can learn a lot and i, I really like your insights about it so uh, from a coaching point of view can you uh, explain for people who may not know how important is that video analysis uh, aspect of coaching and getting your message across to those players? How important is that to your process? If you go back, if you go back to what I just said, that uh, communication decides the quality of your life. You saw my video analysis and I, I, it's not to show off. Or I just like to do them. I just like to even inform people. Actually, I'm busy now in, in, in uh, developing a small course and for, for someone who is, uh, is an expert or even someone who just starts, I think I have a good gift of explaining things in a very simple way uh, that makes people better understand. Um, so when you analyze, analyze games, um, and that's one of the things that most players that I work with always uh, uh, yeah, come back to is that my, my ability to read a game and put that into a picture or into a plan uh, is, is, is very logic and very simple to understand. What is important when you think about analysis is that you don't overthink things. Uh, the most important thing is you need to see the big picture. So if you only focus, if you only focus on one specific thing, you need to know it is related to other things and how to translate that in a right picture. And you saw the, the analysis that I made. That's what I always try to do because football is a very complex sport. Uh, and if you, if you want to win a game, I think it's very important to, to analyze your opponent, 
to know where the weaknesses and strength are, but the same of your own team. So analyzing um, and evaluating of, of, of what, you, what you're doing as a team, but also analyzing the team you're going to play is, is, is an extremely important uh, element of, uh, of coaching. Absolutely. Many coaches give that, give that to, uh, to an analyst. I do that everything myself. Uh, I had last year an Indian analyst with me working, same at Northeast, the same person, very good guy, very nice guy. Uh, but I don't let him analyze the games. I give him different roles. And if you work longer together, he also starts understanding your, your thinking and maybe you can give it a little bit more delegated, a little bit more. But overall, I always do that myself. So having having uh, worked with Indian football for as long as you have, I'm curious as to what are what are your thoughts about the Indian coaches in the in the two leagues that we have. Unfortunately, in the ISL, we haven't gotten any Indian coaches because of the rule that was there before. But I'm talking about I League. What do you have any thoughts about the way these guys work? Um, I, I remember one coach always standing out in my opinion in in, in India was uh, what's his name. Um, Santos, Santos Ketchup, Ketchup. I, I, I always, I'm very bad at names. This is one of my. I, uh, um, this was back in in in, IS, in, uh, in the I League. Um, I think India has good coaches. Uh, I do think still many coaches are a bit a bit influenced by the the English model. Um, that means by either playing the more physical and defense defense and offensively not not too creative. But there also is, you can see a little bit of development, I think. Uh, I think there are a lot of good coaches, but to really grow, to really become better, they should try to uh, and become their, themselves coach, to experiment with, with, with the process of coaching, what you're doing, or to go abroad and do some internships uh, to learn and to see with, for how things in, in Europe or other parts of the, the world are done. Because uh, if you all the time stay in the same area, in this case, uh, India, if you want to become better, you need to get into an environment where um, where you are challenged. Uh, and if you only stick it, it, it within your own area, uh, yeah, that 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 will never really make you grow. I think. Yeah, and you don't learn. You only see. You only learn what's around you. You don't get new perspectives, basically. Yes, and and many people ask like can indian coaches do the isl yeah i'm sure they can do uh, but i do think it would be better i gave you the example when i arrived in the middle east in 2002 or 2003 they already brought young they already brought foreign coaches within the youth system and at that same time players develop but also coaches develop arab coaches develop because they see how other coaches work and they get more responsibilities for instance last year uh, uh, when I had the Ishwak with me, I gave him responsibilities. I think he still needs a lot to learn on how to organize training, etc. But I do give those coaches chances uh, to develop. And you discuss about football, you discuss about the coaching, and that, that's the right process. And if you want to accelerate that, uh, either have a team yourself that you can coach, uh, whatever level it is in India, but also try to go abroad and, and get some internship, try to learn from, from uh, how clubs work, how things are done in, in Europe. Uh, a big uh, challenge or empty space that I have seen in Indian football with all of ISL and I League clubs, or most of them at least, is that the, the role of a football scout doesn't even exist in most clubs. So, exactly. So, how uh, necessary do you think this needs to be implemented in Indian football? Yeah, I... This is, this is for me, is a no-brainer. Um, if you, if you uh, I, I always try, as I said, I go back again to the part of communication, to make, it, to make it understand. And many things are very, very simple. So simplicity, I always believe in simplicity. So if you as an individual, you as a, are you married or are you not married? No, no, I'm 21. <laughs> okay, so, but... If, if, if you are going to look for a wife or a girlfriend, what do you do? You scout, you, you have in your mind uh, uh, um, some criteria how your, your maybe future wife will have to look like. So it's the same thing in a job um, that if, if a, a club, and then we keep it now specifically to football to translate it, is if you meet players if you, for your team, 
Uh, I still see, for instance, in many clubs, they have three or four players for one position. So three or four. So that means already two players for sure they hardly will ever play. And maybe they're very talented. So how many players you recruit, that is one. Two, quality you recruit. You need to have a really good idea about what you want from a player on each position. Uh, you also need to have a really good idea. Thus, you can have a really good player, uh, but he doesn't fit with the club. He doesn't fit with the culture, with the environment. Um, in India, for instance, I remember they always say players from Goa, when they go to other clubs, they, they, they get quickly homesick. So when you, when you recruit, for instance, a player from Goa, you should have a talk with the player. You should really have a, get a feeling like, would you be comfortable living in other parts of the... And I don't, know, I don't know if this is the real truth, but they say that sometimes. Um, so the point here is, what I want to make is that recruiting is, is key. And recruitment is still done in India many times by people or by persons that yeah, not really know the, 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 the dynamics of football. That you just see a few videos or they, they, they hear from, from somebody, oh, he was good. Or I, what I see many times also a player who played two or three good games and right away we need to have him. No, if you recruit somebody, it should be based on, on proper research, on, on a planning. And, and the best way to do that is to have a scouting team. And that means basically when you start a season, when that season starts, you already start from the beginning recruiting for the next season. That's how you plan it. That's what you need to do. And you can have a scouting team of two, three people uh, who, uh, who, who can organize that, who go watch games, etc. And you, you build a structure around it, an idea around it on, on uh, what you want, what kind of a players or even people, coaches. If you recruit coaches, it's the same thing. Uh, do they fit the club? But recruitment is a, is a key, key process. It's, it's almost 50% of your success. So is this something that you've actually tried to implement at any of the clubs that you've been at? And, and if you have, like, what was the response that you got? That's the thing what I'm trying always to, uh, to explain. Uh, coaches always get, uh, get judged by, uh, by the results. But it is easy if you, if you get into a club where, uh, where you also, from the beginning, get the chance to choose your players and to choose the, uh, to set a structure. And in, in the last... Yeah, what is it? I'm 20 years now. No, sorry, uh, 19 years that I'm basically am in Asia. Uh, there are only one or two clubs where basically I got maybe for 60, 70 percent chance to form the team. All the others, you come like halfway in the season uh, and you have to rebuild a team, and that is extremely difficult. Uh, and when even when you then get success by building progress then still people will look at, oh, yeah, but you didn't get a championship. Yeah, but if you come halfway or you didn't get a chance uh, to, to, to re last year in Kerala, the same. Uh, last year, I came from the beginning, from the beginning, but uh, I didn't choose any Indian player, none. And I think that, in my opinion, that could have been better, but I didn't complain about that. I am all about making progress and we do it together step by step. The foreign players last year from the seven, uh, I, I, was, I was able to choose five. Uh, and we did that. I did that with the whole, with the, med with the staff and with the, with the owner that we all had an agreement. Okay, this is a good player. So I'm not the type of person to say, I want that player. Uh, and if, if other people say no, then I also don't want it. Because in the end, you want to work together. You need to be all convinced that's the right thing for us. So... In, in the history of my coaching career, I, I too many times went, got into a job where you uh, yeah, don't have, didn't get the chance to really choose your team. Uh, and yeah, that, but you do not always have the chance. You always don't, I'm, not, I'm not that rich to say I just can't skip any job. I, I'm well off. I'm doing fine. I'm doing okay. And I love working too much. I also have the heart of I want to help a club. But that's not always appreciated. That's really that that's really interesting. So I was wondering if you could actually that dynamic between a coach and the board, right, of the people who actually make the decisions. Could you share like what that relationship actually is like? Um, this is maybe one of my. Uh, no, it's not a weakness. It is more of a because of my the nature of my character, the way I express myself. 
I'm, I'm not a difficult person whatsoever. I'm, I'm very straightforward in my, uh, what I think. And that is maybe where sometimes when you have a relationship with people from the board or who are not really uh, have a affiliation with top sports, yeah, that sometimes is seen as, uh, oh, this coach Ilko is a difficult person. Uh, and I go back again, diplomacy. For me, diplomacy is, is in a polite lay lying. Uh, if you find, if you think something, say it. You don't have to say it in a in a in a rude way. You just because if you want to improve, you want to find the truth. If you want to improve something, you need to find the truth. So building relationship with um, with people from uh, from the management, from the board, uh, is something that is not always easy uh, because uh, yeah, it's it's it, it has something to do with 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 with, with nature. Uh, sometimes they they think that I'm difficult. Well, I'm, I'm totally not difficult. I just say what I think with only one goal to improve. What users has to, to, to say something. If you call a spade a spade, if something's yeah. wrong, it's wrong, but you don't have to go public with it, but you need to be able to talk to each other. And that that's not always understood. I think. Mm. So you've worked in, uh, in Indian football for so long and you've seen it grow and develop and adapt over such a long time, right? So I was wondering, what do you think is the biggest challenge that lies ahead of Indian football, for Indian football? Um, the infrastructure. Uh, if, um, if a nation, if it, any nation, any, any country, uh, if you want to grow, you need to have a proper infrastructure. It doesn't have to be high tech. But the infrastructure, what does that mean? Uh, that you have a properly set up a league. I think the ISL is a good league, but it's too short. Uh, that is one. Uh, if you want to compete with other countries, I, I'm, I'm currently in Oman. Uh, in all Middle East, most countries here, they have two, three, maybe four million people living in the country and, and maybe half of them are even foreigners. A lot of Indian workers, for instance, we have here. But still those countries with a, a less quantity, they are still outplaying India. Uh, why? Because their league, the setup of the league, they play way more games in one year. So it's crucial. It's crucial if you want to grow as a football nation and you want to compete on international level, you need to play way more games. That is one. Two is uh, the same thing. If you want to grow a nation in, 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 in intellectual, you want to have uh, good professors, good doctors, good uh, who can grow, bring up the level, that means you need to have an education. That's the same with football. You need to have a youth, a youth development. And I think there is still with many clubs uh, lacking uh, big time. And that is partly related to money, I'm sure, but at the same time, not a lot of money is invested in, in actually having a proper setup for the youth. There are some examples who, who are doing well. Kerala also was really trying to do that. I think you can go at it, try to do that. But overall, I think that's, that's also a key, a key step to make because everything starts at the, at the bottom. If you don't start there, then who's going to reach uh, yeah, higher up? That is, that is logic. So I think we can end it here. I have one last question for you. So you've spoken so much about, actually not so much, but you've spoken in the past about how you, you wouldn't mind taking up the national team manager role, right? Head coach. So I'm curious as to what your opinion on, if India was to make a mark on the international stage, how long do you think it would, ha it would take for that to happen? Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make a statement on how long it's, it's, it's going to take because if you if you just think logically, if you just logic thinking, you can find that answer yourself. In my opinion, what I could say is um, you need to know your position, your position within within the football hierarchy. Um, what does that mean? You can have an illusion of uh, we have to to change uh, to a playing style, super attacking uh, with, with with India. Uh, and uh, we're going to get results. I think that India, looking at the availability, for instance, on two positions, one is the defense. You don't have, you hardly have any center backs. Not much. There's not much really to choose from. And it's the same thing in the striker position. So that's the first 
a keeper. You have decent good keepers in India. You have a lot of good wingers, uh, wing backs, midfields. You have also uh, a good good occupation. So what I would look at is if you want to compete, sometimes you have to make some sacrifices uh, regarding the setup of your formation. So what I would always do is if we want to get results, because that's what you get eventually uh, judged for, then I think it would be a, bit, a little bit more safe to play, for instance, with three or five in the back. It depends on how you, how, how you, you see it. Why? If you don't have meant much choices of center backs, uh, then I would say, okay, then let's compensate there and put some extra player. Maybe somebody who has the ability, I just say something like uh, Ruhal Beke from, from Bangaluru, who can play right back, but also center back. Do I think he's a real center back? Not, I don't, he's a better wing back, I think. But he could be as an extra cover if you play with three in the back. So that gives a bit more stability and a bit more chance on, uh, how do you call it, on, on uh, success. On, on winning a game. It's the same up front. If uh, Sunil Chatri is not playing, basically you don't have too many players who can replace him. Although I do think there are some options, but I would also choose to play with two strikers. That means that you have not only depending on, on Sunil, but you also have somebody who make runs. There are a lot of players uh, uh, there, uh, like Ashek, I saw or even who, who played there in, in one game as a striker. The idea behind this is a balance between result and even within that formation, if you play five in the back and three in the midfield and two up front, you can still play very attacking football. And what I'm seeing now is too much is looked at, oh, we need to play Spanish way, tucky, ticky, tucky, whatever. It, yeah, you have to be realistic. Uh, and and, and uh, till now, the, all the games that I saw, I think the coach is doing a great job. He's trying uh, his, his best. But till now, we were not able to even play, what was it, the uh, win of Afghanistan or, or uh, Bangladesh. Or, so, yeah, I mean, it, uh, this is not a criticism. It's, it's more, it's just simple logic thinking. That's how I see it. No, no, absolutely. I, I don't uh, disagree with you at all. The reason I was asking this question to you itself is because you see so many people who, are, who keep talking about qualifying for World, uh, World Cup, qualifying for World Cup, but we're not even able to eat, uh, beat our neighbors. This, like we're losing so, badly to these guys. So, I mean, you, 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 you can go from, uh, from uh, primary school to university. You cannot make that step at once. You have, there has to be a, a, a process. And um, as you said, if you can't simply beat on a convincing way, uh, a team like Bangladesh or whatever, that means then you're still not good at it, that's fine. Uh, but then you cannot say like, okay, yeah, within four years or we're going <laughs> to gonna play on the World Cup. That is, that's, that's insane. Yeah, it is. So we can end up. Uh... But I would say, never say never. So that doesn't mean that you're not going to try. But if you put all your all your uh, eggs in one basket and say, we need to reach uh, the, the, the World Cup. And while you're sure you cannot win Bangladesh, that is, you have to be realistic and at the same time be a little bit uh, progressive and dream because anything is possible in football. But realistically, uh, uh, you, need to, to, yeah, as I, you need to stay realistic. And, and that's why I, for instance, said I would, for instance, uh, change the system a bit where you build in a little bit more stability and, and chances for result because in the end, that's what, what you need with the national team. And the thing is, even if you do one day qualify, you don't want it to be just luck. You want to be good enough to actually compete and do well in it. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah. This, this has been an amazing conversation. I've learned so much. And I think the people watching would have also learned a lot from your journey and your experiences. Uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you very much. And I wish you all the best with your with your postca- podcast. Uh, up high, is it right? Up high. Up high. Yes, yes. right? Up high. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All Thank the best. You. Thank you. Bye bye.